Dakle, dobar dan Zagrebe, pozdrav svima, jako mi je drago biti ovdje. I already rehearsed this yesterday, but I'm really glad to be here. This is my first time in Zagreb. I see that you do not react to jokes very well, so I'm extra uh, worried because my talks do not have anything technical in them, they're just jokes. So, <laughs> worrisome for me. A anyways, my name is Božidar, but here it is known as Božidar. At any rate, I'm happy that you cannot pronounce my, that you can't pronounce my name because usually this is not the case. I come from the beautiful city of Veliko Trnovo in central Bulgaria, which you should totally visit if you're ever in Bulgaria. Although, what would you be doing in Bulgaria, right? <laughs> I'm extremely fond of bears, and I'm generally known for my fanatical devotion to the Church of Imax. I truly, deeply, madly, and completely believe that Imax is the one true editor that will bring balance to the source, and absolutely nothing can convince me otherwise. I do a little bit of open source work on the site. Um, I do mostly Ruby, Clojure, and Tmux related stuff. So if you're into this kind of shit, you can check out my projects. I'm also fortunate enough to be a member of a very, uh, very great team led by an amazing person who drinks vodka like most people drink mineral water. It is very dangerous to be around my CTO. I, I learned this the hard way last week in Moscow. And uh, this amazing company is obviously TopTal. Um, I serve as the vice president of engineering for the company. And I believe I speak uh, on behalf of everyone on the team when I say that it is an honor and a privilege for us to help with uh, uh, an event as amazing as uh, Webcam Zagreb. Uh, with, we really love Zagreb and Croatia, and we love Radan. Scourge, so <laughs> yeah, special place in our hearts. So this is boring. If you want to learn more about me, feel free to stalk me on Twitter, and uh, let's get this party started. Before we start it, just a, one disclaimer, because I'm known for my explicit language during talks. If you're sensitive and uh, cannot stand the use of the F word or some other words, you can leave right now. I I do not mean to do it, but it just comes up. Uh, maybe because of my dark Bulgarian heritage. So, I also tend to insult many technologies, but I really don't mean to offend the people using them. Uh, I insult Ruby all the time, and I'm a Ruby developer myself, so I, I call it as I see it. Anyways, why am I here? I'm here because I have to talk. <laughs> But I'm here also because I'm a perfectionist, or at least I believe so. Um, I'm really obsessed with the details in just about everything that I do. And because I do a lot of programming, I'm extra obsessed with the details of programming. Uh, from time to time, I would run into code snippets like this, which is a really horrible piece of Ruby code. Um, and th this is an actual piece of code which I found on this legendary Russian site, Govno Kotro. Yes, it is. So, um, my, my goal with this talk is to eliminate the need for such uh, websites and to put them all out of business by promoting a few good practices which will definitely improve the lives of you, your coworkers, and everyone who has to touch your code. Um, but I will start a bit meta. I will start by saying that languages are pretty hard. And by this, I mean all languages, both programming and natural. And you should trust me, because I believe that most of you here are locals, and still you had to go through all those uh, textbooks to master the fine Croatian language, right? So nothing comes for free. Nothing comes uh, from within. We, also have, uh, we always have to study, study, study to become better. Um, I will speculate that the basic language uh, usage of any language is something quite, quite easy. You know, even politicians can use English <laughs> to some extent. <laughs> but uh, the correct usage of any language is quite hard, quite challenging, 
and the effective usage of a language is extremely challenging. It usually takes a lifetime to master. And by effective, I mean using the full power and beauty of a language, a very extensive uh, vocabulary, all the grammar, and using it uh, in a correct manner, of course. And this comes pretty hard. There are some questionable books like uh, Fluent in Three Months, which promise you that you can learn any natural language in three months if you, ha if you try hard enough. But I'd say that this is just a lie. Um, and there are even more questionable books like uh, Learning C in 21 Days. And I'd say try something like 10 years. Because uh, can you really learn anything about a programming language except superficially its syntax for 21 days? If there is a single takeaway for you from my presentation, let it be to read the amazing essay from the legendary Peter Novik, Teach Yourself Programming in 10 Years. It is full of so much wisdom, which I do not want to repeat here. But programming is hard, and it takes at least 10, 10 years to master it to some extent. So um, the idea for this talk came to me several years ago. Um, it is obvious that English is not my native language. My English is kind of poor, regretfully. I have a strong accent. I use a limited set of the vocabulary, and I tend to confuse the grammar from time to time. But I wanted to do better. And I told myself, I want to become a better writer in English. So I started evaluating options, and there were so many options and I'm a pretty busy guy, and I believe that most of you are pretty busy as well. So like most uh, developers, I was looking for some shortcuts, some way to cheat the system. In Bulgaria, we have this word tarikat, and I wanted to is So uh, I found this very small book which promised to make me a better writer. Um, it is something like 80 pages, tiny book. I was supposed to bring it here, but I totally forgot. And supposedly, this book made Stephen King a good writer. This wasn't uh, the best advertisement ever, because I do not like his writing style, but still, it looks kind of promising. So I bought this small book, I opened it, and on the first page, I saw the following advice. Use the active voice. Hmm, interesting, I told myself. So why would I use the active voice? And then they had an example. You can say, my first visit to Zagreb will always be remembered my, by me. Or, if he agree that this sounds kind of indirect and devout of passion, you can rephrase it like this. I shall always remember my first visit to Zagreb. Direct, passionate, efficient, and shorter. So, I call this legit. And uh, I believe many people would call it as well. Uh, Afterwards, I read the following advice. The word personally is often unnecessary. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And here's an example. Personally, I love Emacs, but because I am the subject of this sentence, everything is personal, so I just love Emacs. Fuck personally, to hell with it. So, uh, in a nutshell, the elements of style is a style guide for the English language. It is um, a curated set of supposedly good practices which spares you the process of making trivial decisions about the use of the language. Because the rules are laid out, you don't really have to think about the rules. And because you do not have to make trivial decisions, you can focus on making uh, the really important decisions. Ex uh, for instance, what is the uh, topic you want to convey to your readers. And uh, this is pretty cool. And in an ideal world, a uh, style guide is always a pretty short and concise document. Um, I have learned from experience uh, by reading various books on various subjects over many years that uh, the longer a book is, the uh, less, less uh, <laughs> fortunate the ratio of content to bullshit is in this book. So if a book is short, there cannot be that much bullshit in it. There are very big style guides about English. Do not read them. Plenty of bullshit. So um, it is kind of hard to get, uh, kind of easy to get hooked on style guides. 
and forget that from time to time, um, you know, we have to think because supposedly we're the smartest animals on the planet. And um, what this means about languages is that uh, the ultimate level of mastery for any language, whether it is programming or natural language, is to know whether, when to break the barriers of the established conventions and go into a different direction to, uh, to, to make your thoughts uh, even clearer and uh, more powerful. Um, so, because this is a talk about programming, I have to bridge it somehow to programming, and uh, in my opinion, this is the greatest programming book ever to be written. So, it, it says uh, um, somewhere near the beginning that programming must be written for humans to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. And this is a very powerful message because people often forget about this. So, this this quote makes me believe that similar rules apply to natural and to programming languages. And if you bear with me for just a few moments, I will make my case. So, uh, let, let's start with uh, an example in English. This is uh, some ordinary English text. It is well formatted. Don't try to read it uh, because the font is ah, the font is bigger than I imagined. So. Uh, probably you notice that this isn't actually English, this is lorem ipsum. But because it is using English letters, because it is formatted properly, the mind isn't immediately alarmed that uh, something is wrong with the text. If I, however, change the formatting a bit, our minds uh, are immediately panicked. What the fuck is this? Why is it looking like this? Why isn't the heading normal? Why are the paragraphs uh, mismatched? Why are we using upcased characters here and there? And perhaps this is just a shortcoming of English. Perhaps if we use a more sophisticated language like Hrvatsky, there won't be an issue. So I didn't, didn't find the lorem ipsum for Croatian, so I just went with a political article from some of your newspapers, something promising reform for the next elections or whatever. I, I hope this happened, uh, but uh, you tell me. So, even though it is bullshit, it looks pretty nice, right? <laughs> but if we change it a bit, tell me, are you still feeling comfortable with this? Hmm? Anyone? Radan, what do you feel? Shit. It's shit. <laughs> okay, so even the great Croatian language is susceptible to poor formatting. Insight number one. And if we finally venture to the realm of programming, I'll be using uh, snippets with Ruby, because yesterday I ridiculed PHP, and today I want to redeem myself by ridiculing my own language <laughs> to some extent. So this is a very poorly formatted Ruby method. Uh, I'm, I'm ki kind of near a nervous breakdown, in case you're wondering. I stop talking, but if we reformat it a bit, well, that's an ordinary Ruby method. Uh, if we take a look at this simple Ruby snippet, it looks quite nice. If we look at this Ruby snippet, it is exactly the same thing, but it definitely doesn't uh, look nice, because unlike the Ruby interpreter, who is a pretty cool dude, uh, doesn't care about uh, white spaces, indentation, and uh, marginal concerns like this, we humans are limited in our capacity to process text, and without the proper cues, it gets harder and harder for us. Moving forward, another English example. In English, we have a rule how to format the possessive of nouns. So, we are going to um, format possessives like this. Bujidar's talk, Batman's bad claw, Emacs's magic, and yeah, there is plenty of Emacs magic, try it out. I will be selling Kimax throughout the entire talk. Um, and in Ruby, we have similar rules. For instance, we have a rule how to form the names of the predicate methods. This is by appending a question mark to their names. So in Ruby, we would have names like even, completed, Batman, and uh, Radenculus. Uh, in English, we have uh, the, the following rule. The paragraph should be your uh, unit of composition. If you do not have paragraphs in your English texts, it, it becomes harder for, for the readers to uh, understand 
where you stop making one point and start making another point. And we have similar rules for programming languages. For instance, in a language like Ruby, we would have the rule make the method the smallest unit of composition, and then we would have classes and modules and, and whatever. In English, we have uh, did this practice to omit needless words to make our speech more direct, more clear, and more concise, and according to some people, even more vigorous. So you can say something like, he is a man who, but you can also say he. It has exactly the same meaning, but it doesn't have any of the bullshit. So from time to time, people think that uh, adding a few extra words makes them sound more sophisticated, but it just adds indirection and noise. Let us be direct and precise. So we can say that her story is a strange one, or we can just say her story is strange. Exactly the same, we, we saved a few characters, easier to type, easier to pronounce, easier to process by our tired brains. In Ruby, we have adopted similar practices over the years, so we omit needless words. No experienced Rubyist would ever write code like this. The then is optional, so we just drop it. Same goes for uh, the final return of a method, because in Ruby, this is optional, we just drop it. Maybe, maybe many Rubyists read the elements of style. I don't know. Maybe it is a coincidence. In English, there are plenty of words which are causing confusion and are commonly misused on a daily basis. For instance, I know that uh, half my friends have no idea what is the difference between father and further. Um, and uh, to illustrate this with some examples, do we have to go much further? and I decided to pursue the subject further. So one is uh, a measure of distance, and the other is a measure of quantity. And in all programming languages, there are so many constructs that are often confused. I, I regret that I didn't opt to use JavaScript, because then I would have had so many more examples. But in Ruby, we have four ways to compare objects. So, I can tell you that 95% of Rubyists have no idea what the difference between the four of those is. And you shouldn't know it either, unless you're a Rubyist. But still, um, the mastery of a language is always related to a mastery of its vocabulary. Mm. Near the end of the Elements of Style, the authors summarize uh, a strategy, an approach to write with a good style. So um, one of the cornerstones of good style is to be consistent, uh, to be consistent. And in English, basically, it uh, means that you shouldn't write text like this. What are the inconsistencies here? Can you spot them? So, his, they, not very consistent. In Ruby, we suffer from similar problems because there are so many ways to do the same thing in Ruby. So, one Ruby developer would write this code, and another Ruby developer would write this code. They're exactly the same, but there are a few differences. So how many differences can we spot? One, two, three, four, five, six. What the fuck? <laughs> this is exactly the same code. It is uh, questionable why the authors of the language um, made it possible to deviate so much from one style, but still, this is something to be kept in mind. Consistency is important because if your code is not consistent, some people will definitely be alarmed or confused by some of the choices you made. Another point, it is very important to be clear. So um, everybody loves uh, saving keystrokes by using uh, abbreviations or acronyms these days. Um, and if we look at a few Hrvatsky abbreviations, uh, le let's see what is the confusion that can be created by them. So when uh, most people see HP, they wouldn't be certain whether we're speaking about something Croatian, and they would immediately assume we're referring to Hewlett Packard. But I'm a very big fan of uh, Croatian punk, and for me, HP is Hladno Pivo. Probably for you as well. DNK probably means DNA in Croatian. I really believe it does. 
But a friend of mine told me that for him, DNA, DNA means this. <laughs> I was also told that this is an acronym that really uh, often pops into the news here, but how many people here know what it means? I was really impressed when I read it. Uh, so, so scary. Uh, if I was a criminal, I would be really scared. Um, and in a programming language, you can also introduce uh, ambiguity and confusion just as easily. For instance, in Ruby, there are some magical global variables with really obscure names, like this one. Any idea what this means? I don't have an idea, because I know it has a longer alias with a more descriptive name, and I'm always using it. Same goes for this, which means this, this, which means another obscure thing, but at least it has letters in it. Um, in, um, in Ruby, this is the more, most concise way to format a string. But it, it, reads, uh, it, it looks really confusing, because for my mathematically inclined mind, um, a percent sign usually means a module operation, and this definitely doesn't look like one. So, uh, if we dive a bit deeper into, the, uh, deeper into the standard library, we'll see that we can rework our code like this, or we can improve it even more by dropping percent %d percent %d and replacing it with something meaningful. And we can even uh, find out that there is an uh, alias for the C, met uh, C legacy method sprintf, which is for math, and we got to something that is a bit longer, but much, much clearer. And th this is a big win. Um, so supposedly, Ruby is a language optimized for uh, programmer happiness. Everybody says this, and it is a total bullshit. Uh, trust me, I'm a Rubyist. I know bullshit. Uh, it is a bullshit because Ruby is a huge language. So no huge language can be optimized for happiness because huge language Huge languages make us make decisions, and making decisions is hard. Making the right decisions is super hard. I get headache from decisions all the time. For instance, I'm super excited to be here, and I want to print three times, hello, webcam. I have one option to do this, a second option to do this, a third option to do this, and I'll stop here because I have more options, but I do not have enough time for all my options. And could somebody tell me which the best option is? I really li like, uh, would like to get some guidance because I'm really misguided. So it, what if I try to upcase a few strings in an array? I could do it like this, or like this, or like this. What is the right way? Or is there a right way to begin with? And it turns out that I'm not the only one who has been asking uh, himself those very same questions. A couple of guys who are uh, mediocre developers, read a few mediocre books, <laughs> uh, wrote a book 41 years ago. Uh, the book is uh, named The Element of Style in Programming. And uh, it, it it goes into great detail for, uh, for what are the recipes to make our programs uh, more readable, more clear, and uh, easier to comprehend. Um, th this book draws uh, a lot of inspiration from uh, the elements of style, um, w which I showed earlier. It is pretty much uh, the, the same form factor, it is pretty much the same length, and the structure of the book is identical. The book has 56 rules in it. Most of them are uh, not language uh, specific, so they apply to every program uh, uh, we could possibly write in any language. The, the first uh, rule is pretty simple. Format a program to help the reader understand it. That, that makes a lot of sense, although many people, even experienced developers, often forget about this. The second rule, write clearly, don't be too clever. And let me illustrate this with an example. Because Rubyists are always trying to be clever, it is very common in our community to convert any object to a Boolean value by using a double negation. However, many people are understandably confused by this, and I would always use uh, the more explicit, 
albeit a bit longer version of the same code. Because if something introduces even a small amount of confusion, this is not the code you should be writing. Same goes for um, performance optimizations that uh, sacrifice clarity. For instance, in Ruby, this is the fastest way to sum 10 numbers. It is ugly, it obscures uh, the intention of the code by implementation details, and it can be simplified a lot. This would be marginally slower, but it is way easier to comprehend. And I believe that this applies to many languages. And uh, another point, there is an even faster way to do this. There is a mathematical formula for uh, summing a sequence of numbers. You probably have heard it at some point in your lives. So if we replace n with 10, we get this, and it would be faster than the loop and uh, just as confusing. So the other point is don't diddle the code to make it uh, faster. Find a better algorithm. So a better algorithm always wins. And uh, a few other points uh, in, in the general direction of uh, making things faster. So make something right before you make it faster. Half the developers I have worked with over the years seems to uh, forego this rule. Make it fail safe before you make it faster. And make it clear before you make it faster. People don't really think about these rules. Uh, and when I tell them to you, I know what you're thinking. Uh, this is basic uh, stuff. We all know it, we all work like this, but even I do not work like this from time to time, so I know that we'd be kidding ourselves on occasion. Um, another uh, basic but very important rule from this book, instrument your programs and measure before making efficiency changes. Uh, a real story from my previous job, uh, we had a crazy colleague named Borko who would always uh, do um, epic performance optimizations without testing them. And usually, his uh, performance optimizations would introduce performance degradation uh, al along the lines of 500%, 10,000%. It just uh, depended whether Borko was on a row one day or not. Uh, we were all, always uh, very scared when he would push something to master without uh, submitting a pull request and just uh, coming with a few beers, guys, I solved all the performance issues of, of our system, and I was like, Borko, 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 Borko. <laughs> True story, so measure. Measuring performance optimizations is the only way to prove that you actually optimized something. And by optimizing something, you might have degraded the performance of something else, so measure the performance of the entire system, if feasible. Another basic rule, use variable names that mean something. So you can use variable names like this or like this. You tell me which is the clearer version. And a uh, uh, more subtle thing about naming is you should always be really precise uh, about naming things. For instance, uh, let, let's assume that we are doing an online, online gambling application and we have to verify whether our uh, customers are all Adults. So in most countries in the world, I guess in Croatia as well, you become an adult when you reach the age of 18. But this is not the case in all the countries. So if your application were to become an international success, in, in the States you have to do different checks for every state. In some countries you have to do different checks. And th th this method's name becomes a bit confusing. And you could have just named it adult way clearer, although not immediately obvious. So we should always spend a second or two before naming things in our applications, because th this can lead to some deep and profound improvements. I'm really fond of deep and profound. Hmm? I sound sophisticated this way. So another basic rule from the book, don't repeat yourself. Everybody knows it. Everybody repeats themselves when they're in a hurry. I will just copy-paste this bit of code and I will refactor it afterwards, which happens five years later when somebody else is maintaining your code. Please, do not do this. Uh, These uh, small time savings never, um, <laughs> never uh, end up the way you foresee them to. 
and a favorite rule of mine, parenthesize to avoid ambiguity. So this bit of code and this bit of code are exactly the same, but in the first example, you have to think for a second about the precedence of the operators, right? No matter how experienced you are. But if we have no ambiguity, we have nothing to think about. And that is a big win in any language. A few, a few rules from the book regarding the usage of commands. They're, those are really fun. So <laughs> um, here's a bit of code which says, uh, this method does blah, 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 it returns an array, but we clearly see that it returns a set. So somebody read just uh, the command, tried to use this in their client application, and got fucked. So what is the, the point? The point is that the authors of the book were right. Another very fun example, private instance variable. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, we should always uh, try to avoid repeating our code in the comments. I have seen so many <laughs> comments like this. What is, what is the benefit? What are you telling me, Captain Obvious? And uh, the greatest comment I ever read. So we have, to, we have to go over it in greater detail. Dear maintainer, once you are done trying to optimize this routine and have realized what a terrible mistake that was, please increment the following counter as a warning to the next guy. This is a bit sexist, but total hours wasted here, 42. <laughs> For the love of the maker, do not do this. Fix this shit. And yeah, this is a great Bulgarian, a philosopher, Yuan of Java. Um, he urges you to follow my advice in a very polite manner. Um, at any rate, not all uh, style guides can be generic. After all, there are peculiarities to every language or framework or whatever you're using. So from time to time, it makes sense to have a style guide that is a bit more specific, that targets the precise technology stack you're working with. And surprise, surprise, we have plenty of those for pretty much every popular language, framework, or technology out there. For instance, the Python programming language has PEP8, which is more or less the official style guide for the language. There are plenty of tools that would enforce it automatically. Use them and be happy. Java used to have an official style guide, but it was abandoned 20 years ago, meaning uh, six months after it was published. Uh, these days, the only popular style guide for Java programs is maintained by Google. You can check it out. It is pretty reasonable. The Go programming language uh, sets uh, the, the bar pretty high. They have a great um, style guide, which is written by the maintainers, the authors of the language. And they also have a standard tool to format your programs in the correct idiomatic way. So that's a big win. <sighs> JavaScript, JavaScript. So. As you would expect, there is nothing standard about JavaScript, but uh, that there are a few popular uh, uh, resources about how to write effective JavaScript code. I am fond of the Airbnb style guide and a bit less fond uh, of the Google style guide, but still uh, using them, applying the wisdom there uh, will definitely get you somewhere. PHP, believe it or not, they have a style guide, although not, uh, uh, not exactly official, and I guess few PHP developers ever read it, but it is actually good, and uh, I urge everybody to take a look. It is so long that it actually has two parts, so plenty of advice. Uh, and what about my beloved Ruby? Well, we do not have uh, a style guide per se, at least not an official one. We have one uh, reasonable a reasonably prominent community-maintained effort. Same goes for my other favorite programming language, Clojure. No official documents and uh, kind of very poor official documentation in general, but still a pretty decent um, community-maintained style guide. Most of those style guides served as the inspiration for some uh, automated linters, and it is generally a good idea to apply them in your day-to-day -day workflow. But let's, let's go back to the meta level of this talk. 
Languages are always evolving. Um, I, I, I recently tried to read some uh, old Bulgarian text, uh, text from the end of the 19th century, and I was having a bit hard time with them. So I have reasons to believe that the Bulgarian language has changed. I'm sure that this applies to Croatian, and it also applies to every, every programming language that, it is, that is worth uh, learning and using. And with the changes that happen in a language, the good style practices for the language evolve as well, which is kind of, uh, kind of reasonable when you come to think about it, but still might not be apparent always. For instance, when I started playing with Ruby, this was the way to write a hash literal with symbolic keys. And, and it, was, it was the way to write them because there was not an alternative. But for better or for worse, somebody decided that we need a second syntax. And uh, after a, a lot of arguing uh, and uh, many flame wars on many forums, it was decided that this is the proper way to write a hash literal with uh, symbolic keys these days. So all the style guys were updated, and we had to align our applications with the new best practices. What I'm trying to say is that uh, Reading a style guide just once is not a good idea. You should always reread them after a major release uh, of your language, framework, or whatever the document was targeting. And uh, b before I conclude, I'd like to say a few uh, words about style consistency in general, um, because it doesn't really matter what your style is. The important thing is to have some style. Uh, there are several levels of style. You know. People always have personal preferences. Uh, there is the project, uh, the, the code style employed by a particular project. There is the code style employed by a particular company. And there is the code style that is generally favored by the community in question. The important takeaways, your personal preferences mean shit. You should just disregard them. It is extremely important for any project to have a very consistent code style. Otherwise, uh, this will leave a very poor first impression to the people who are perusing the code base. And uh, in, in the words of uh, Charlie Chaplin, you do not get a second chance to make a first impression. I generally never contribute to projects uh, who have a very inconsistent code style. Or my first contribution there is to, um, to hmm, align the code style to one single preference. Uh, ideally, all the projects in your company should have the same style. Otherwise, it would be hard for the development team to work on multiple projects there, because people will always have to think uh, whether I was supposed to write like this on these projects or like that. So in any organization, you should push forward for a company-wide, organization-wide coding style. This is very, very important if you want people to work on different projects. And uh, ideally, if you uh, do everything like the community does it, onboarding new people on your projects uh, in your organization will be uh, way easier. I know we've had many flame wars about Ruby code style in TopTal, and I believe that every one of you had uh, a few of those uh, for a different language in, in their company, their organization. So this is something real. In the end of the day, my message for you is style separates the good from the great. It's not that important what your style is. It is important to have it. Uh, Samuel Jackson approves. So this is pretty much all from me. But there is one more thing. We have beer. My co-workers uh, from TopTal bought a lot of beer, which is supposedly very good local beer. Uh, and they need your help drinking it. So after my talk, before you go to lunch, drop by the TopTal booth and ask for the TopTal branded beer. And Jivialé. Uh, Chvala. Uh, we, have time, we have time for questions. Or, oh. We do have. Uh, first compliment for the talk. 
uh, because I have experience uh, as a programmer uh, when I couldn't read advanced, to advanced uh, code base. And uh, my question is, uh, if you have a new programmer and some uh, advanced language constructs is, uh, are introduced, like in Python you have list comprehensions or some streams, uh, what was the way to introduce new programmers? And when I learn, learned languages, uh, I had, uh, I had, I needed time to comprehend advanced features of the language because over the, over the time, uh, code got shorter, but uh, it's much expressive, but it's more difficult to beginners to comprehend. Well, the, the, there isn't a, a magic recipe for this. Uh, you know, people just need training, they need your help, uh, the help of the people who know that those uh, advanced concepts. And it's generally a very good idea to have some onboarding documentation or onboarding presentations which guide the people through the practices and the workflow of uh, any company. So this would be my advice. I hope this answers your question. Any more questions or lunch? Oh, another one? Hey, um, a question regarding comments and code. Um, every once in a while, uh, formulas come up and there's some, some math in code and something has to get calculated. And it's usually hard to read, so I put some comments explaining what uh, the math does. And it's not pretty, but it's the best I came up with. Do we have any advice? how to better handle these situations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, ideally your code should have uh, no comments. Uh, the, the model should be small, uh, very small. Uh, and by modules I mean uh, methods, uh, classes, whatever. And there are uh, method level or class level documentation should be everything that somebody needs to understand them. From time to time, dropping a line or two of comments is okay, but this is usually an indication that uh, something is suboptimal and there is room for improvement there. I usually uh, treat every comment in my code base as a to-do, come back here, motherfucker, and improve it. <laughs> <laughs>